Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, the Drop Point Hunter. So, one of the founders of the modern handmade knife movement was a guy named Bob Loveless. And probably his most famous design was a small drop point hunter. I think to, to this day that design stands up as one of the most elegant uh, and effective knife designs of all time. So what we're going to do today is a drop point hunter that is, let's say, kind of inspired by the Bob Loveless design. We're not trying to copy the Bob Loveless design, but it's going to be a knife that's in that kind of genre. Now, the, the drop point hunter to me is one of the best basic fixed knife designs that there is. It's small, it's uh, pretty you know, concealable, pretty easy to use, you can cut string with it, you can skin game, you can do a lot of different things with it, and it's not bulky and hard to carry. So I really like this kind of design and I think you're going to have a lot of fun working on it. The knife I'll be showing you how to make today is what's known in knife making parlance as a stock removal knife. This means that it's ground to shape rather than being heated up and banged into shape with a hammer. Now my bread and butter is the hammer banging stuff, but every now and then I like doing something like this. I'm going to make this a pretty comprehensive how-to, so if you've never done any knife making, there may be some equipment and concepts here that you'll have to play a little catch up on, but the intent is to make it very accessible to the beginner. The knife will be a simple, fairly workmanlike drop point hunting knife made from stainless steel with a stainless steel bolster and a wood handle. It'll be a full tang blade, meaning that the steel runs all the way through the entire handle so that it's visible all around the handle. In the end, this knife will look reasonably fancy, but that's only because I'm using a pretty wood. I could just as easily make it out of a cheap, bland looking piece of ash or hickory or even micarta and it would just be a good functional knife to throw in the truck or take out to the deer stand. So first let's talk design. I like the drop point hunter design. A drop point is a simple blade shape that drops a little along the spine as it comes down toward the blade. Hunting knives normally have fairly short blades, somewhere in the three and a half to five or six inch range. I tend to like hunting knives in the four inch range. So that's what we've got here. The handle's basically just big enough to fit my hand. Now let's talk materials. First, blade steel. So this design today is going to be made from stainless steel. I'll be using 440C stainless steel. This is perhaps the classic stainless steel for knives. Now, stainless is a somewhat relative term. Enough contact with corrosive material can make almost anything oxidize a little, but with about 1% carbon and about 16% chromium, this is a very stain resistant steel. If you're just starting out doing stock removal knives, this is a great steel to start with. Everybody these days is using BG42 and all these super steels, but 440C is still a good solid performer and it's a reasonably affordable choice, much cheaper than the so-called super steels. Additionally, we'll be using a bolster made from 316 stainless steel. Some steels can be heat treated to increase their hardness and some can't. 316 is in the non-heat treatable realm but it's extremely stain resistant so the salts in your palm are less likely to cause it to oxidize. Finally, we'll be using a burl wood for the handle. I keep tons of different kinds of woods in my shop. Wood, even fancy wood, is comparatively cheap. This neat little piece of mesquite burl has been waiting for the right project and this is it. So, let's get started. I'll begin by drawing the blade. Everybody has designs that appeal to their eye, and the great thing about making your own blade is that whatever design appeals to you, you can make it. As I mentioned earlier, this design is sort of a nod to the drop point hunter designs of Bob Loveless, one of the founders of the modern handmade knife movement. 
Now, nobody would mistake it for one of his knives, either in the overall design or in the technical details, but it's in that realm. Now I'll cut the steel on my chop saw. I'm using a piece of one and a half by one eight inch thick 440C. I drew the design out on the blade just to make sure it would fit. You could just as easily cut this with a hacksaw. Straight from the mill, all steel has scale, that is iron oxide, lying on the surface. This stuff is actually harder than steel, so you'll need to get rid of it abrasively. I'll turn to my belt grinder. You could also use a bead blaster or an angle grinder and a flap wheel or whatever. This just happens to be my little thing. I have this ugly little gizmo with a bunch of magnets in it that I use to hold stock flat against the belt. Now be aware if you're going to try something like this, if your stock is warped, you won't be able to do this very effectively because it's going to cut off the parts that are warped toward the platen and not grind the other part so you'll get something that's not parallel. Anyway, once I've flattened it and gotten rid of the scale, I'll trace the outline again. Now, if you want to go into semi-production mode, repeating certain models over and over, you want to make the outline a little more exact, but I prefer not to do the same design over and over again, so once I get the basic layout, I'll just tune it by eye as I go. Next, I'll drill a quarter inch hole right here. You'll see what that's all about at the very end of the video. I'll also drill a quarter inch hole for the thong tube. Here I go on the belt grinder. I'm using a 40 grit Norton ceramic belt. These belts are pretty expensive, but you can really wail on them and get lots more wear out of them than, say, cheap aluminum oxide belts. I like them for roughing things out when I'm going for maximum stock removal. Incidentally, if you don't own a grinder, don't despair. There's nothing I do in this video that couldn't be done with files. Check out my video about how to make a knife from a file for more information on that. So, while I'm grinding away, let's talk grinders. I've got a whole video on grinders that you might want to check out if you're in the market for a grinder. But, this is a Bader B3 2x72 inch grinder, one of the most popular grinders among knife makers. It's very versatile, featuring a number of possible setups, as you'll see. But there are plenty of other designs, some much cheaper. Anyway, right now I'm using the flat platen. Also, watch how I use the wheels on the top to radius some of the curves. I'll also use my 12 inch disc grinder to get some nice 90 degree edges. You can just as easily use the little grinding table on the baiter to get good right angles. It's really up to your taste. Once I've gotten the blank roughed out, I fiddle quite a bit to tune the design so that all the subtle angles flow well to my eye. Incidentally, if you're new to this, you'll see that belt grinders produce a ton of friction which can easily heat steel till it glows red. Notice that as the stock gets too hot for me to hold, you'll see me leaning over to dip it in a bucket of water to cool it down. Okay, once I've got the blade blank pretty well laid out, I'll move on to the next thing. This blade will have a satin finish on part of the blade, so I'm going to go ahead and establish that right now, starting with 320 grit, then moving to 600 grit wet or dry sandpaper. I know in advance that the handle will be covered, and the blade bevel will be ground away, so the only part that I really need to be finicky about is this little crescent right here, encompassing the top of the blade, and this little section right here, which is known as the ricasso. One thing to be aware of is that you need to keep the blade very flat where it transitions from blade to handle. If you sand too aggressively in this transition area, you'll round things off or leave a sort of dip, and gaps will form between the blade and the bolster as a result, and that looks really bush leaf. I use machinist squares to check the flatness and make sure I haven't rounded anything off. 
Once I've got this part all prettied up, I'll prepare my bolsters. As I said earlier, they're made from 316 stainless steel. Other decent grades for this purpose would be 303 and 304. 303 especially is much easier to grind and a little less hard on drill bits, but 303 and 304 are both marginally less stain resistant than 316. You could also use brass, you could use nickel, silver, this is really just a matter of taste. Of the three, brass is by far the most fun to work with, but it also oxidizes really easily so it requires maintenance if you want it to stay shiny. First thing I'll do is flatten out the back of the bolster pieces. It's very important that this be super flat. If not, you'll end up with gaps between the blade and the bolster. I'll knock off the scale and rough out the side edges on my belt grinder, then finish them on the disc grinder. Be careful with the disc grinder. If you don't lay the pieces on the disc with a lot of care, they won't grind flat. It'll sort of roll the edges and again you'll get gaps as a result. This takes a little practice. Disc grinders also love throwing things around your shop and you just have to get a feel for where your grinder's sweet spot is. Once I've established the flat bottoms of the pieces, I'll grind 90 degree angles on the sides. It's worth using a machinist square to check that your table hasn't shifted. If the table is set at say 88 degrees, which you probably wouldn't be able to perceive by eye, it wouldn't matter how careful you are, you'd end up with an ugly gap between the wood and the bolster on the handle. So anything where that 90 degree angle is mission critical like this, I always check for 90 with my machinist square before I start grinding. I'll also check to make sure that the two bolsters are parallel and exactly the same width as I'm grinding. A note here about symmetry. One of the big hallmarks of high quality blades is that they're symmetrical from side to side. If one bolster is bigger than the other, it'll look cattywampus. I measure them down to the thousandth with my digital calipers, but if you don't have calipers, you can put them next to each other and feel them with your finger, and that will be absolutely as accurate as these calipers in making sure they match. You can do any number of things with bolsters radiusing them along the front edge, cutting compound curves or angles into them, whatever. Normally I would radius them, but in this case we're aiming for a fairly simple design so we'll keep both edges of the bolster straight and parallel. One thing to be aware of is that once the knife is assembled it's very difficult to do anything to the front edge of the bolster without the danger of messing up the blade's polish because you're going to be polishing in a different direction and so you'll leave abrasive scratches that go in the wrong direction on the blade. So I'm going to go ahead and grind a little compound bevel into the bolsters using a piece of scrap wood as a jig. Then I'll clean them up with sandpaper, sanding them right out to 1200 grit. They'll get little scratches while I'm doing other things with them, but after this they'll only need a tune-up to look perfect. Once I've got the bolsters roughed out, I'll drill some holes through which I'll insert pins that will hold the bolsters in place on the knife. I'll position them on the blade exactly where I want them, mark them, and then drill the holes. Now 316 is kind of nasty on drill bits, so I recommend using some drilling oil to keep them from snapping your bit. I'll be using 1 8 inch pins, so I'm drilling 1 8 inch holes. It's important that the holes in all three pieces, the two bolsters and the blade itself, match from side to side, so the sequence I drill them in is important. You can drill them all at one throw, but I wanted to make sure the layout was right, and also it's kind of difficult to clamp them sometimes. In fact, you'll find getting everything clamped together correctly to be a big pain in the neck. It's really the biggest challenge in this drilling process. Here I am clamping the bolsters to the blade blank. Again, check for symmetry. If one bolster is even a few thousandths of an inch further forward than the other, it looks pretty bad. I just use a straight edge. If I have to do a little adjusting, so be it. In this case, I'm kind of whacking on it with a little bitty hammer. In order to drill these holes, I'll need to use a fairly small clamp, otherwise I won't have clearance for my drill chuck as I'm drilling. You'll see how that works here. 
Another important point. Once I drill the first hole, I always put a locator pin through both of the pieces. If the vibration of the tool causes a shift of even a couple thousandths of an inch, it'll screw everything up and you won't be able to get your pins to pass through all three pieces correctly. A second locator pin will go in after the second hole is drilled to make sure that the subsequent two holes are clean. Now at this point you have a choice. If you want to, you can mark the exact shapes of the edges of the bolsters and you can grind the edges almost to their exact correct shape. If you're making production blades or blades where you're repeating the same designs, unquestionably you'll want to do this. For one-offs like I generally make, it's a bit more of a coin toss. I prefer not to trim too closely because it leaves me a lot more room to screw up. But there's still a pretty good argument for trimming them too, as we'll see later. Next, I'll drill a couple of holes through which the handle scales will be pinned. I'll be using these nifty little goodies called Corby fasteners. Their center shaft is 3 16 of an inch, so that's what I'll drill. We'll see more about how this works when we assemble everything. First, I center punch them to make sure the drill bit drills where I want it to. Then I drill the holes. Notice I've wrapped the part that I polished earlier with masking tape. You'll see me masking things throughout. This process saves tons of repairs and it makes the people at Home Depot happy because every time they see me coming, they bring out a forklift full of tape to sell me. Now it's time to grind the blade. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades.